So glad you're with us today. I'm going to pray as we begin. Just uh, I need to hope uh, we can just uh, continue to be focused on these great songs, focus in the scriptures now. Let's pray as we jump into the word now. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time. I pray that you would help us, Lord, to concentrate in what you have for us this morning. Lord, we want to take lightly the time we have in the Word together. And so, would you equip us and strengthen us now as we jump into your Word together? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to be in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 9, if you have your Bibles here this morning. Now, we've been in the book of Colossians together. Colossians is a book where it says some pretty dramatic things about Jesus Christ. In chapter 1, verse 15, it says, He is, Jesus is, the image of the invisible God. Verse 19 says, He is the one in whom all fullness dwells. He is the one from whom we see the mystery of God revealed. The mystery of Jew and Gentile. Racial uh, opposites, opposites in culture there. Reconciling the body of Christ's church. In chapter 1, verse 27. Jesus Christ is the one in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Chapter 2, verse 3. And so everything in the life of the church, from the beginning to the end, is surrounded by, centered in Jesus Christ. And for Paul, as he writes the book of Colossians, we've been in together, Jesus being the center is not just him theorizing or uh, being theological here. He's trying to connect to us as believers, the church, into centering our lives on Jesus for certainly gathered worship, but in everything we do, that Jesus Christ is central. Colossians displays, we've been uh, with you together, we've been talking about Jesus over everything from the book of Colossians. Now, what I'd like to do uh, this week and next, these, these two Sundays, is we're going to take a step back from the book of Colossians for a moment. And we're going to look at a key aspect that Colossians talks about, about Jesus in the area of Jesus. If you heard it in chapter 2, verse 3 there, I just mentioned a moment ago, Jesus is the wisdom of God. He is the one who puts the wisdom of God on display. So what I'd like to do is take a two-week hiatus and go back and look at the wisdom of God in the Scriptures. Okay? We're going to start here in the Old Testament in Proverbs chapter 9. And I think it's, it, it's a key thing for us, even before we read this text here this morning, is to consider this. Jesus, New Testament, Colossians says, Jesus is the person of wisdom. He is the one in whom all the fullness of the wisdom of God dwells. And so he is the person of wisdom. And when you back up to the Old Testament, what you begin to see is, you see, see the personification of wisdom. Okay? We're going to see that in the text here this morning in Proverbs chapter 9. There's a personification of wisdom. She is this wise lady that is speaking truth to us. Okay? So in the Old Testament, there is this personification of wisdom. And what happens is, as we go through time, as we go through the continued progressive revelation of Scripture, we get to Jesus Christ, who is the person of wisdom. The, the, the wisdom of God on display in Jesus Christ. So I want to make sure we highlight that as we get into this text here this morning. I mentioned uh, Proverbs 9, where we'll be at this morning. Proverbs 9, if, if you don't remember, uh, shame on you, you'll remember the, the overview message of like, you know, four, six months ago. We'll talk about Proverbs together. Um, but uh, we talk about Proverbs, and in Proverbs 1 through 9, what you see is, Proverbs 1 through 9 is this really more, uh, not really narrative, but an extended teaching from Solomon in the book of Proverbs. Once you get past Proverbs 9, and what we think of usually when we hear the Proverbs is we think of these wise sayings. These little pithy one-liners that really stick with you. Uh, I don't know if you had a, a dad or an uncle or a neighbor who had those, you know, not pithy one-liners. Uh, Proverbs, when we think about Proverbs, we think of chapters 10 through really 31 where, where there's just wisdom after wisdom after wisdom. Chapter 9, though, is the, the capstone of the first part of Proverbs, and it's one of those things where uh, it, it takes us in Proverbs 9 to a choice, okay? What we're talking about this morning is the choice and consequences of wisdom. 
Okay? And it is taking that seriously. So when you get to the end of this first part of Proverbs chapter 9 here, you get this, like, right in front of you is a choice. And the choice is, will you choose wisdom or not? Because the reality is, if you're not going to choose wisdom, if you're going to reject wisdom and go your own way, then stop reading. All these little wise sayings that just explode the rest of the book are a waste of your time if you're not going to choose wisdom. Okay, so this morning, what I want think about is, are we, do we, are we going to choose wisdom, and what are the consequences of that choice? Okay, to, it's to take it seriously here as we get to this point. It's kind of a stopping point. You either get off the, the train here, and you're like, ah, oh, that was a nice idea, but I'm not really going to choose the path of wisdom. I'm going to go my own way, or I'm gonna, I, I will choose wisdom, and I'm going to go on the path of wisdom that goes through the Old Testament all the way to Jesus Christ. Okay? So that's, that's how I want to outline it for you a little bit. Just think about that. Now let's jump into this and think about the, the choice and consequences concerning wisdom. Look at Proverbs 9 with me. I'll read it through and then we'll jump into the text together. <coughs> Proverbs 9 says, Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn out her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her meat. She has mixed her wine. She has also furnished her table. She has sent out her maidens. She cries out from the highest places of the city. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. As for him who lacks understanding, she says to him, Come, eat of my bread and drink of the wine I have mixed. Forsake foolishness and live, and go in the way of understanding. He who can corrects a scoffer gets shame for himself. For he who and you rebukes a wicked man only harms himself. Do not correct a scoffer, lest he hate you. Rebuke a wise man, and he will love you. Give instruction to a wise man, and he will be still wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. For by me your days will be multiplied, and years of life will be added to you. If you are wise, you are wise for yourself. And if you scoff, you will bear it alone. And here we see in verse 13 the following another voice. It says, A foolish woman is clamorous. She is simple and knows nothing. For she sits at the door of her house, on the seat by the highest place of the city, to call to those who pass by, who go straight on their way. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. As for him who lacks understanding, she says to him, Stolen water is sweet, and bread eaten in secret is pleasant. But he does not know that the depths, that me, the dead are there, that her guests are in the depths of hell. I want to do those two things this morning with you, the choice and the consequences concerning wisdom. So let's look here. There's a beautiful picture painted in this chapter. And it's, it should be surprising to us because if this is the book of wisdom, we used to think of the Proverbs, and if it's masterfully given to us in this wisdom after wisdom after wisdom, we would expect some good illustrations, wouldn't we? We'd expect some powerful illustrations like we see here in the midst of the wisdom literature. And, and, and like I said before, if you, if you go through this text, read through this book to this point, you're, you're at a decision point. And, and there's this crowning illustration here to help you understand. The decision has come to a head, right? We have to decide, when we look at this passage, what are you going to do? Chapter 9 here, we meet these two ladies. Verses 1 through 12, Lady Wisdom. Verses 13 through 18, we meet Lady Folly. And we're meant to compare and contrast the two. And so do that with me. I want to give you about four, four aspects that drive us towards this choice. The first aspect that uh, drives us towards the choice is there are two pathways in life personified here. There are two pathways in life personified. Let's look at them both. First, as I mentioned, there's Lady Wisdom. Especially in verses 1 through 3, we meet her and we read things about her. It says in this text that wisdom, she has built her house. Remember, remember again, this is a personification of a direction in life. Okay? The direction of wisdom, the way of living life skillfully. Some call it, you call it the, the good life. Okay? What is the good life, the way of wisdom? 
Do you want to live a good life? Well, then here is this pathway for you. Will you choose it? Will you choose it? This is the lady wisdom. She has built her house. Okay? There's this aspect here of a, an established way. A house that's built with seven pillars. Often in the scriptures, the, the, the number of seven is this uh, aspect of perfection or completion. This is an established way that is in front of you. Many have gone down that way. It's tried and true. Will you choose this path of lady wisdom? It's the complete picture. It's the house that uh, you know, we, were, we were down in, in over in Tennessee for the wedding, and uh, one of the lakes we paddled on, we were like, you would like go to the certain section of the lake, and it was like just magnificent houses, right? And this, this picture here in verses 1 through 3, we're like, that's lady wisdom's house, right? That's the kind of house with the seven pillars that's established. It's like, I want, I like that house, right? I want to go and visit that house. I want to be there. That's what I want to aspire to, if you will, this aspect of the good life that Lady Wisdom is displaying for you. It's the complete picture, right? Beyond complete, it's an established home where we have a feast going down. You see the, the next few uh, parts of verse 2 and following. We, she slaughtered her meat. She's mixed her wine. Her table's all set. The maidens are going out and inviting her, 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 her female servants are going out and, 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 and inviting people to this great feast. Okay? So, the, you know, it's this beautiful picture, right? The, and the, 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 the meat's roasting, the wine's poured, the table's set, everything's ready for the guests to come. And the question before us again, driving is, will you be a guest of Lady Wisdom? Will you come to her way? Will you eat at her table? And will you go in that direction? Okay? It's not just a big home with plenty of rooms. It's a home full of laughter and full of food, full of what you need to be satisfied and what you need to be guided in life. That's what Proverbs 9 is putting on display for you. Now skip down to verse 13. There's a very different picture. Right? There's two voices here. There's competing voices. We're meant to compare and contrast the two. The second one we meet is Lady Folly, Lady Foolishness. She offers another direction. Another pathway that you and I have to choose between the two. How is she described here? The New King James says here is she is clamorous. The ESV says loud. I, I was thinking it is uh, Lance's getting ready for VBS. It's kind of like VBS with uh, the two teams screaming at each other, and you're looking at the person up front going, "Okay, make it stop quick. Okay, this needs to stop soon." A brain's going to explode, right? You know, this is like that. Like, this is uncomfortable. It's kind of a picture of a crowded marketplace where there's just pandemonium, chaotic noise. And you're just like, ah, right? You're, you're getting uncomfortable here. Uh, this, she is loud in your face. But what, what we see here is, so she's all up front. But what do we see next? There's no depth to her, the text says. She's simple and knows nothing. Now, there's nothing new here, but it brings us to a decision point. What you're, what you're meant to see here is there's, there's really chapter 9, there's no new really information from the first 8 chapters. The first 9 chapters are this opening of Proverbs. As we get to Proverbs 9, you're meant to think back to certain things that he's already talked about. Okay? And so what he's doing is he's using these two illustrations, though, to drive you to say, which one are you listening to? Lady Wisdom or Lady Folly? Where are you going to go? Right? Because if you think about this picture of Lady uh, Folly here, you're meant to think back to some, some specific passages, especially chapter 7. In chapter 7, we meet the adulterous woman. A woman that's this, this loud, boisterous, who is, who is uh, you know, inviting you in, and she's seductive. She is, this is what you're meant to see, this picture of, of Lady Foolishness. It's the fast track of excitement up front, and the, the, the emptiness that follows, right? The foolishness of sin, the seductiveness of sin, and then the, the, the guilt and the pain that so quickly is attached to that path of life. I, I, I'm, I, what I love is that the scriptures, they're honest, aren't they? They put in front of you the reality of life. Every one of us have this decision. Every one of us has to choose, are you going to go the path of wisdom or are you going to the path of foolishness? And it puts it right out in front of us. Okay? And, and you think about passages, I was thinking of this passage this week of Hebrews 11.25. In Hebrews 11.25, the scripture is very honest with us. 
You can enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. There are pleasures to sin. But what is the text also honest about? That only lasts such a short time. And then there's just a mess that explodes. Okay? That's what is putting on this picture here between these two folks. So the first thing is there's two pathways in life personified. Masterful pictures. You have to choose which path you take. Now here's another observation. Not only are we going to compare and contrast them, but we also want to see certain similarities. Look with me next. There's, there's the exact same message between these two people. And it's kind of shocking here. It's powerful. Look at verse 4. Lady Wisdom, she cries out from all the high places, verse 3 says. Here's what she says, verse 4. Whoever is simple, let him turn in here. As for him who lacks understanding, she says, and then she goes on. Look at verse 16. Verse 16 says this. What does Lady Folly say? Lady Folly says, whoever is simple, let him turn in here. As for him who lacks understanding, she says, and then it goes on. But what are they offering? They're both offering the same thing, right? They're offering for you and I. They're extending this invitation that says, hey, come to me and I'll teach you. Come to me and I will give you what you're looking for and I will give you instruction. I will guide you on the path that I offer. That's what they're offering. They're offering a direction and a path. They're offering a place of refuge for you to come and to get understanding from them, to grow in them, and to walk in their pathway. Both, there's a, both of them have a food picture. I don't mean to make you hungrier this morning, but you heard about Lady Wisdom and this feast prepared. Table set, the wine's poured, the, 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 the meat's roasting, and you see here there's also stolen water and, and uh, bread in secret that's being offered. There's both of them. There's a meal. Come to me and I'll give you food. I'll give you this instruction and teaching that'll satisfy and it'll, it'll prolong our relationship and, and grow you. Give you a direction. These are competing voices, but they offer the same thing. Now, now I want you to notice though that there's dramatically different results. And we're talking about the consequences in a moment, but they, they, they're all the same thing, but this take refuge me and I'll guide you. But, but look at uh, the next few verses here, verses 7 through 9, as we think about this choice again, the third thing I want to say here is there are different responses. Okay? There are different responses that begin to emerge and tell the story of where you are. Because the reality is for all of us, there's some of this like, hey, I'm choosing the wise path. We all are like, yeah, yeah, I'm on the wise path. We all want to say that, but you know what tells the story? The, the responses of your life begin to help the story emerge, the real story emerge in your life. And that comes out in verses 7 through 9. So these characteristics of your response begin to show. Okay? Your responses are telltale. They give the story away of what's inside. Look at verse 7. You know, verse 7 talks about when, when, when you get challenged or corrected and fireworks go off. Fireworks explode. The anger of your tongue goes off. What do you put on display? The path of wisdom or the path of folly? You display yourself a scoffer, the text says, one who's proud, full of mockery, and knows your own way, the way of lady folly. The second half of verse 7, when you get physically violent when you're challenged, when things don't go your way and you respond with, with, with anger and violence now, Again, it's not the way of wisdom. Verse 8, verse eight I found kind of a scary thing. Uh, it says here, Do not correct the scoffer lest he hate you. Rebuke the wise man, he'll love you. It begins to shift now between the, the scoffer responses and the wise man responses. But notice both of them here. There's this, there's this entrenchment that happens in our life. The further you go down this path, whichever path you're on here this morning, the further you went on that path, the more and more you become entrenched in it. It's kind of a scary thought, isn't it? When you keep going down this path, you get deeper and deeper into it. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in, like, a, a truck or something, you're trying to get through some place, and you're in the mud, and your tires are spinning. One of the first things you got to do is stop the tires just digging holes <coughs> under your truck, right? you got to stop digging the holes to get out, right? So this, this point here is what we do, though, is we, we get more and more entrenched in, in the way we're going. 
And so we've got to be careful here, right? Be careful. You're entrenched and stuck in where you are. The way of wisdom or the way of following. Now we start seeing the opposite here, though, in, in verse 9. If you give instruction to a wise man, he will still be wiser. Teach a just man, and he will increase in learning. What's beautiful about this passage and encouraging is you have a choice in front of you, and both your responses begin to show where you are on that pathway. And you become more and more entrenched as you go down that pathway. We think about going into wisdom instead of hate, and, and, and the other aspects here, you, you will learn to love truth. You will learn to grow in wisdom, going deeper and deeper into it. Not hating the challenge, but you know, here's the challenge, right? When, when we get corrected in, in you know, this aspect of you'll know, love it in verse 8, and you'll grow in it in verse 9, I find this difficult. How about, and I want to take that back over to the bigger picture. Not all of us are like, somebody just hammers us. We're like, yes, thank you, you know? Uh, we're not usually like that, right? But you know what the wise person will do? The wise person will say, you know what? Maybe it wasn't the spirit that I would like to hear it in or whatever. But you know what? That was right. I needed to hear it. And I'm going to grow because of it. The wise person will receive correction that's right and true. And will say, you know what? I needed that. Maybe not initially. Maybe it will be a little bit of a bad reaction initially. But there will be this like, you know what? I needed that. That was for my good. And that's the path of wisdom that says, I'm going to grow in this. I'm going to receive the correction. And those responses begin to tell a story, right? If you're here this morning, you go, you know what? I'm on the path of wisdom. But these aspects of the scoffer tell your story. Then folks, don't, don't go down that path any longer, right? Don't become entrenched in that path. Choose, there's a choice in front of you. Choose the path of wisdom. You will, you will grow. This one, one powerful thing here is if you give it to the wise man, you'll grow in wisdom. You teach a just man, and you'll increase in learning. There's this growth trajectory for the wise and a growth trajectory, if you will, for the foolish. You'll continue to grow in these things. Now, I want to point out in case you miss it, right? We are not born wise. We're not born wise. I mean, most of you that hung around your kids or teenagers, you're like, oh, man. I, I got you, right, 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 I totally got you on this, right? But, but let me remind all of us, we're not born wise. We need to grow in this. The, the invitation here is to choose, and it's not a choice where you just go, oh, I'm going to choose wisdom. You just plop in the seat of wisdom over here, and you're just, hey, I'm going to go, okay? It's not a one-time decision to go, yeah, I like wisdom, and I'm going to sit down right here, and I'm going to just live life and do nothing, okay? That is not the picture here. And neither do you plop into the seat of folly and just stay there. You go down the pathways that are in front of you as you make this choice. You go down those pathways. We sometimes treat wisdom like a simple one-time choice. It is not that. We you sit and stay, we go in directions. That's what these, these passages are putting for us. Christianity in America is not... It, it ought not to be. It cannot be just a plop in the seat of being a Christian, and there you sit. That is not even the right picture of Christianity. To sit here and stay there. Just attend. That is not the biblical picture. Okay? And let me, you know, this, this aspect of learning and growing, let me just pick on the guys, especially for a moment here, okay? Guys, you might have to lead the way. Biblical, okay? Folks, we have... Can I say this rather bluntly, right? You know, the church doesn't need any more 40-year-old babies in the faith. We've got plenty of those in our churches. We don't need any more people to just plop in the seat of Christianity, attend a service, and make your wife happy or your mom happy or just let, you know, you feel like that's a good choice of wisdom. We don't need to plop in that seat. We want you to grow in God, grow in wisdom. That is the biblical picture here. Growing in wisdom, making progress, not being the same person that you were last year, five years ago, ten years ago. There's, there's some progressive, there's ups and downs, but there's progressive growth. That is what this is calling us to, a pathway of growth. Let me say one, one final thing about this choice. It begins to really take some shape here in verses 10 
uh, and for 12 years, the guiding light of wisdom is this. It's the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord. It's the key principle to understand about beginning to walk down the pathway of wisdom. Verse 10 describes that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. When it comes to growth, there is the reality that each one of us are affected to some degree or another by our environment. Okay? You know, when, when you think about where you're at, you know, in your job, where you're at spiritually, what do we tend to do? We tend to look around, I'm better than them. Or I, I, I made it part of them, or I'm doing, I need to get a little higher with this. I, we compare ourselves, we, in our environment, it's natural for us to do that. What the, what the fear of the Lord does is it compares you with who? The fear of the Lord says, I compare myself with the knowledge of the Holy One. That's God Himself. If I want to grow in wisdom, I don't just compare myself with my environment. I say, you know what? Who's God? I want to understand and know Him. And that's the direction I'm going. That's where I want to grow. To Him. You'll find all kinds of comparisons up and down next to you. But you won't find the kind of direction that you need for wisdom apart from the fear of the Lord. It's what makes the wheel turn on the pathway to wisdom. The fear of the Lord. And it makes sense, right? You know, if I'm really to pursue wisdom, then I want to go to the one who is creator God of all things, right? If he made the world, do you think he knows and can describe to you the path where it's going to give you the good life? It makes sense, right? If, if that's who God is, then, then he can explain what's the best thing about life and what direction to go. Lady Wisdom. The direction of godliness. Proverbs is put on display. Proverbs 1 verse 7. Proverbs 9 10 says in Proverbs 31 30. This aspect of, of the fear of the Lord is displayed throughout this book. Okay? It's not this idea of being scared and cowering and doing nothing. It is a, it is an aspect of an awe and reverence and respect. It's saying, I want what he wants. I respect and revere his name in such a way that what he does, how he tells it, I want to hear and I want to do what he says. It drives me from that respect to say, I want what he wants. I want to grow in that pathway. Is one of your first thoughts, what does God want? Is that one of the first thoughts when you think about the direction, the pers pers perspective that you have? As you move about life, is one of your first thoughts, I want what God wants. That's what the fear of the Lord drives us to. You know, increasingly in our culture, God's ways, as he explains in his word, are viewed as the enemy of the direction we want to go. Increasingly in our culture, you tell me what God says? Oh, not that way, we're going to go this way. That's the story increasingly of our culture. Uh, what, about, what about the church? What about the church? When it comes to God's ways, as he's explained in his word, how are we doing in the church? Is it our last resort to go, oh yeah, what does God want? You know, I, I think, you know, one of the most telling things about this often is our prayer life. You know, are we like when things are crazy, things are crazy sporting, right? We got the sound system craziness and everything else going on. Is it like my strength, my way, or we go, man, God help us right now. It might, it might not be like, hey, I got to stop and like everybody, we're not doing anything for the next three days, we're just praying. It might be like, hey, God help me and then we're unplugging some stuff and smoking, right? You know, it might be, it might be like not like, hey, I'm not saying you're like the most spiritual person is this person who just sits up in their attic or, or in their little closet and they don't talk to anybody else, all they do is pray. But I'm saying my prayer life and your prayer life reveals this aspect of do we really fear God? Do we say first, what does God want? It comes out in our prayer life, one of, one of the key ways it does come out. The fear of the Lord is when you and I look to God for who He is. It's when we embrace His desires and avoid what He disapproves of. You see it here in the text, right? The life of wisdom begins and ends with the fear of the Lord, walking in awe and reverence of Him, living life in light of the question, what does God want? Thinking of that first. 
And here's the reality, you see verse 12. The reality is, if you're wise, if you're wise for yourself, and if you scoff, you will bear it alone. Here's the reality, kind of the, the tough reality here this morning. No one else besides you can make this choice. This morning, you can't have somebody else around you make it. You can't have somebody you respect and older generation really want this for you and it just happens. This is something that you and you alone can choose. Will you take, what choice will you make, the, the pathway of Lady Wisdom or the pathway of Lady Folly? The choice is yours. Let's talk about the consequences for a moment here this morning. I want you to notice this between Lady Wisdom and Lady Folly. And again, we shouldn't be surprised here. They're exact opposites, right? As we think about consequences here. But I think that as we look at these two things, we discover a different orientation between Lady Wisdom and Lady Father that they're all about. Look at verses 11 and 12. Okay? Verse 11 and 12, we think about Lady Wisdom. It says here, your days will be multiplied. Your years of your life will be added to you. You notice first is highlighted, it's a lot highlighted for Lady Wisdom is the future, right? You think about this is going to be added to you. It's going to extend your life, right, in great ways. Your days will be multiplied. And then what we see come next. Comes next is personal satisfaction comes second. If you are wise, you're wise to yourself. It will, it will bless you. You have to make a decision yourself, but it's going to dramatically affect you in your day-to-day -day moment. Just like the opposite will affect you personally as well. But you see, first is this future orientation, and secondly, there's this personal satisfaction. Okay? You see it here in Lady Wisdom? Look at verse, verses 17 and 18. You see different emphasis, a different orientation by Lady Folly. Verse 17 and 18 describe it a little different way. They talk about stolen water is sweet and bread eaten in secret is pleasant, but you don't know the real end of that. Right? So there's the exact opposite now. Personal satisfaction is the, the first piece here with Lady Folly. Stolen water, uh, bread, hidden away in secret because you probably stole that too, right? What do you want? You get it now. This emphasis on, you have something to desires? You pursue those desires. Have fun, get what you want, take it. Take some, right? Pleasure is first and foremost for lady folly. Folks, is it, where is our heart? Is your heart first personal satisfaction? That's lady folly. And then, and only then, do we, much later, when we're already trapped in it, do we see verse 18? He didn't even know. The text says he didn't even know that that's the path of the dead, right? All the guests of Lady Folly are in the depths of hell. Wow, right? this, is, this is powerful, major consequences. Exact opposite orientation and emphasis. Future, eternity, and, and, and first and then my personal satisfaction, or my personal satisfaction, satisfaction, I take what I want, I get what I want, life is here for the grab, and take it. And then we'll just deal with the consequences of eternity later. The exact opposite we see. What do you live for, right? Now, I ask you today, what do you live for? Are you saying, you know what, eternity first, and, and I'm willing to put temporal things on the shelf? Or are you saying, you know what, no, I, I live purely for the temporal things. It can be hard to see, right? Sometimes it's very easy, but sometimes it can be very hard to see where we're at. One illustration in, wisdom, in the wisdom literature, it, it comes in the area of finances. Often it comes, Jesus uses as well. The area of finances was another way, a good barometer of where your heart is, okay? I've been talking to Lance here recently. He's in the middle of the uh, Dave Ramsey Financial Peace University. And, uh, you know, Dave, Dave Ramsey's pretty bold, right? He's like, give me a checkbook and I'll see where your heart is. <laughs> he's like, you know, if you, Dave Ramsey was listening to something as, as Lance was eating lunch the other day, and he's playing as Dave Ramsey while I'm writing my lunch, you know? Um, but but uh, Dave Ramsey said, you, you're poor because you make poor people decisions. And you're rich because you make rich people decisions. He says, there's two paths. If you make these decisions, you're going to go this path. If you make these decisions, you're going to go this path. There's plenty of people, when you think about finances, you think about this aspect of wisdom where it shows that have disciplined themselves rather than to see something shiny and be like, ooh, that's shiny, I'm going to just buy it, right? That if you, are these the temporal things? 
Did they grab you? Your life is really about all the temporal shiny stuff that you can get your hands on? Or is your life, you're going to discipline and deny because you know those aspects of eternity that far outweigh this temporal pleasure? Okay? What do you live for? Everyone here today lives for something. Everyone today makes these choices that are in front of us in Proverbs 9. We make these daily decisions. What path do you choose? What direction are you going? We make daily decisions about growing in that path, getting more and more entrenched in it. Are you on a path of wisdom? And Because it, it leads all the way through the Old Testament passages like this, where, where wisdom is personified as lady wisdom. It leads all the way through the scriptures, all the way around to Jesus Christ. And all the way from Jesus and what he has done for us on the cross, all the way to our life and our daily decisions. The path of wisdom leads all the way to today and your choices. Perhaps today you need to pause and consider your path. Perhaps today you need to humble yourself and repent of saying, you know what, there's aspects of Proverbs 9 that have forced me to a decision point and say, you know what, Maybe I keep talking, I'm on the path to wisdom, but I'm really practically, all the shiny stuff of this life has my attention. All the temporal stuff I'm living for, and I'm not really denying myself for eternity. I'm not really living now in light of eternity. It's, been, it's growing emptiness in my heart. Perhaps there's a, there's, a, there's a need to stop and say, stop entrenching yourself. Stop going deeper into the wrong path that you're on. I invite you to talk to somebody. Talk to a friend of the church. Talk to somebody about your faith and where you're going. I'd like to talk to you about where things are. Choose wisdom, right? First pray and commit your way to the Lord, and then talk to somebody. Get stopped and then move in a different direction. Change your trajectory. Now, next week, as we can, next week, excuse me, Lord willing, as we continue down this aspect of what is wisdom, how do you grow in wisdom, I'm going to look at that with you. Some practical elements about growing in wisdom. As these two paths are in front of us, and the scriptures are certainly encouraging you, don't choose the path of folly, choose the path of wisdom. Let's talk next week more about what does it mean to really grow in that path of wisdom. We'll do that next week. Let's pray, and then uh, keep will come and close us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your amazing grace. Lord, it's amazing to me that uh, Lord, we know that, that folly cries out on the streets and, and is drawing us away. But Lord, I'm, I'm so encouraged aspects of the grace of God's passage that Lady Wisdom is too. God, thank you for wisdom calling out into our lives. Wisdom not letting uh, the only voice be the way of foolishness. Lord, I know there's so many times in our life where we feel so pulled because there are so many voices of foolishness. God, would you, would you reveal our hearts even today? Would you help us to understand where we are? Lord, this is not some theoretical message about grandiose, unconnected truths of where we live. Lord, each one of us is going in a direction. I pray, God, you give us wisdom. Help our hearts, because it can only be from our heart, Lord, that, that you work in such a way that we choose your pathway. Thank you for your grace today. Praise the in Jesus' name. Amen.